next, I will be bringing on Irene Healy onto the stage. So Irene, you're free to turn on your camera and mic as we speak. And Irene is the founder and CEO of New Attitude Prosthetic Designs, Inc. And she'll be, be presenting a presentation called Using 3D Printing to Create Better Prosthetics for Women. So without further ado, I will hand the stage off to you, Irene. Thank you. Thank you, Maddie. So I want to start by thanking Nora and Women in 3D Printing for giving us this opportunity to connect and to share. And I welcome the opportunity as well to talk about my work in, in the field called anaplastology, which is the creation of um, facial and body prostheses. And given the fact that this is women in 3D printing, I'm going to focus on my work in breast prostheses. So I like to distinguish the work an anaplastologist does from a limb prosthetist by saying that we specialize in soft tissue prostheses since most of our work is in silicone. And an anaplastologist focuses on realism and uh, recreating the appearance of someone. So what I find interesting is that, you know, there's this deep-seated human need of people to replace a missing part of their body. And if you look at history, there's examples of, of prosthetic devices all through history. And you can see on the internet, there is a toe prosthesis that was found in a tomb in Egypt. So it's probably about 5,000 years old now, and it's made out of wood. And I just sort of feel it's just kind of wonderful to be part of this long tradition of making things for people. And every era has the material that dominates that period of time. There's every era has their material culture. So if you look at the history of prostheses, you can find things made in wood or tin or silver, plastics, silicone. And I really think 3D printing is the material culture of our time. Um, and the other thing that I find really fascinating about prosthetics is that a prosthesis is not made in isolation. It, it really is the crossroads so many different aspects of society. There's the um, personal narrative of someone who's lost a part of their body. And then there's the societal view of how we treat people who have an altered identity. Um, there's the economics, how much does something cost? Can it be made so that people can, can uh, acquire it? And there also is the, the philosophy of the society and the philosophy of the healthcare system and, and um, what society feels their responsibility is to provide for others. So like um, limb prosthetists, uh, anaplastologists have a clinical practice. We work directly with patients to design the prostheses. And that gives us a lot of, uh, and we also fabricate them. So this gives us a lot of insight into the needs of our patients. Um, and because we fabricate it, we can also see the outcome. So we're always tweaking uh, the materials we use and changing the process. So it's actually a very dynamic field. And I trained as a sculptor. And after, uh, after that, I also uh, then get, got a medical art degree. And my first experience doing prosthetics was working at a hospital doing, uh, at a cancer center doing facial prosthesis. And then after a while, when I decided to work for myself, um, I started looking at breast prostheses because I felt there was a very large market and a very large need for it. And it was very underserved. Um, and, and one of the, there were, there were two things that I really noted coming from an academic hospital-based um, environment. One was the standard of care for a woman who's lost a breast uh, is to acquire a pre-made prosthesis. And it's the only body part where it's considered adequate to use a pre-made prosthesis. So every other body part that's not gender specific, the norm is to provide a custom-made prosthesis, but still today, uh, a pre-made prosthesis is considered to be adequate. So obviously one begins to think, you know, could this be because it's a female device? Um, and because, you know, it's pre-made, obviously it's going to be, it's going to be adequate for some people, for some women, but there's no way that something pre-made is going to serve everyone's needs. And the other thing that I, I found interesting was just how much, how much is the lack of information regarding uh, breast prosthesis, like how little research has been done. So if you do a literature search, uh, like a PubMed uh, search, there's just very, very few studies on breast prosthesis, whereas obviously in other types of prosthetic devices, uh, it's quite common. So again, uh, looking at the prosthesis is not existing in isolation, but existing as part of a, a broader societal context. I realized you really had to understand breast prosthesis in the context of breast cancer. And you know, if you had asked a woman 
in the 50s, 60s, or 70s, if they knew someone with breast cancer, the probability is that they didn't because nobody spoke about it. Uh, it was um, shameful um, because you were talking about your, your, your breast, a sexualized uh, body part. And um, it made me realize that, you know, the, the breast disease is what we take now as being adequate, really developed in this um, environment where it was never discussed. So for an object to become good, to become better, it really needs to be scrutinized, critiqued, used, evaluated. So in some, in some respects, the breast prosthesis, to, in my mind, almost symbolizes or um, embodies the, the trajectory of women, women's, the women's health movement and, and the way women have been sort of, um, have women have experienced breast cancer treatment. Um, so even though there's uh, very little written about breast prosthesis, there are some really good books on the um, history of breast cancer. And one of them is by a journalist called Ellen Leopold, and the book's called The Darker Ribbon. And in it, she speaks about Rachel Carson, who um, was an ecologist and a biologist who wrote a book in 1962 called A Darker Ribbon. And the book discusses the impact on the environment from, from chemicals. And it was very impactful. I mean, Rachel Carson's work led to the development of the modern environmental movement but there was a lot of pushback against her by the chemical industry. And at the time which she was publicly defending her work, uh, she also had breast cancer. And um, in Ellen Leopold's book, she has Rachel Carson's letters to her surgeon, Dr. Krill from the Cleveland Clinic, in which Rachel Carson as a scientist is trying to understand her disease and make decisions about her treatment. And during that period of time, she never publicly disclosed that she had breast cancer. It's something that people didn't know about her at that time. And so it makes you really realize how isolated women were and just how, how different it is from today and how, how alone uh, people like her must have felt. But I also realized that when I was thinking in terms of what I'd like to talk about today, that really it makes me also feel about how much we lack women's stories, that there's a huge lack of women's voices, um, documentation of women's experiences um, when it comes to all sorts of aspects of women's health. And particularly, you know, with breast prosthesis, what I find interesting is the standard of care for surgery from about 1880 to about 1980. So for about 100 years, the standard treatment was the radical mastectomy, which was not only removing the breast, but the, also the axilla, the underarm area, but also the, the muscles of the chest, the pectoralis major and minor. So women were left with extraordinary defects. And when I started my career, I actually remember seeing a few women who had had a, a radical mastectomy. So even though you can read patterns on breast prosthesis, there still is no written account of a woman's experience um, wearing, wearing a prosthesis. And this isn't just interesting for historical reasons, but I, it also affects us today. Because if you were to go to um, a legislator to try to get uh, laws changed regarding coverage for certain prosthetic devices for breast prosthesis or any other type of femtech, the first thing they're going to ask you is, well, where's the evidence that there's anything wrong, if there's any complaints? So the lack of a historical knowledge and the lack of, of us having recorded women's experiences still has, a, a, I think, a profound impact today. And it also would be the same when, you, when women are going to get um, funding from a VC, the first thing you're going to be asked is, well, where is there's the need? I mean, there's no documentation that, that there's any anything wrong with what we have in, 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 the, in the status quo. Um, and even, you know, often when I would read surgical articles, like the article will usually start with a preamble and often it'll say something like um, many women decide to have surgical breast reconstruction because they're unhappy with the breast prosthesis. So obviously the first thing I think is well just make a better breast prosthesis and then you realize that you know a lot of the world doesn't think like us um, but it also it also makes me realize that what a in, in a way what a privileged position that we are now, in nowadays because we have the opportunity through social media, through conferences like, uh, like this one, to share our stories and to be heard and to have it written down and be recorded. So, and we also have the possibility now with the um, access to manufacturing to actually make a difference. 
So I've come to realize that in a way we almost have a moral obligation to speak of our experience, to um, let it be heard what we think about uh, our things, to speak authentically about our, our experience, because really what we're doing is we're providing the platform for other women to build and, and create better devices. And also as female makers of things, we also are in a privileged position nowadays that we can actually make things that make a difference in people's lives. Um, the other thing that I'm often told is uh, regarding breast prosthesis is that it doesn't matter. It's just a breast and that's covered up anyways. And so I would say having come from a background in facial prosthetics, the breast prosthesis is probably one of the most difficult prosthetic devices to create because you have, um, you have the challenge of creating symmetry in a body that's no longer symmetrical and you're placing the prosthesis right next to the shape and volume that you're trying to mimic. Uh, you have the weight issues, the shape, the sense of touch, color, um, the torso moves, it sort of flexes, it, it extends, it rotates. Um, you have often women have pain, so you have to sort of map out different areas which, which uh, can't come in contact with the prosthesis. Um, and the chest moves a lot with the, you know, with the movement of the arm. So again, I think there's a whole field of study and there's a whole um, need for, um, for, the, for the breast prosthesis to be elevated on par with other types of prosthetic devices. Um, and the other thing I, I sort of find interesting is that uh, in some respects, you know, with the, the, the one thing I'd like to point out that I think is very important sort of not to lose contact with our patients because it's really through women and working with women that we hear their stories and we can understand really what it is that works for them. And um, with, you know, with, with technology, I would say that it's really rare that you just sort of stop doing what you do and flip over to an, another type of, of manufacturing. So I would say the benefit of working directly with women is you really are able to create a roadmap of what works what I have found really fascinating with new technologies is once you have that roadmap, then there's the interest in seeing, you know, what you can, how you can go along that roadmap and be more efficient. So basically in the practice that I have now working with women doing breast prosthesis, I use scanning to, uh, I actually hope to, and I prefer to see a woman pre, prior to surgery where I can scan her uh, before her surgery. Um, and then I do uh, the scan after the surgery and uh, I do a lot of my work now with 3D modeling um, digitally, but I still use 3D printing to prototype. So I still think it's important for um, working in the prosthetic field to work directly with, with the patients and get their input and use 3D, pre 3D printing the way that it originally started as a prototyping device. Um, I th I'm very excited with the new developments in, in 3D printing of silicone, and I'm really looking forward to working with a lot of the um, providers of that technology. And I really sort of feel that we're at this um, wonderful crossroads now, because again, we have the ability to communicate with women um, because of social media, again, women's stories are being heard. Um, one person's experience is a personal narrative, but when many women talk about one thing, it becomes sort of a societal thing. So I think that we have the opportunity to really, um, really use 3D printing to make a huge difference in women's healthcare. And I really sort of applaud all of us, all of you that are doing something. And I think no matter whether we're working sort of directly with the public or something, doing something um, sort of more removed from the public, I think all of us sort of working and acting directly out of our own experience sort of contributes to the body of knowledge from which we can, can build better, better devices. So I look forward to the conference. I look forward to staying in touch. Uh, um, you're welcome to, to email me and I can answer any of your questions. I had this fear that my mic had been turned off the whole time because I was wondering because I hadn't heard anything. I thought, oh my God. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Would you like me to field some questions for you, Irene? Sure. Great. Okay, Irene. 
So one of the top upvoted questions was, how do you address the question of like why, or sorry, gosh, I'm going through the ones from before. To Irene, how do you incorporate different elasticities of soft tissue into prosthetic design? Is it a touch slash feel consideration? Could you repeat the question? So when you incorporate different materials that have different elasticities or different properties of soft tissue into the prosthetic design, how do you think about that? And is it a touch and feel consideration or is it something more for the function and form of fit? Uh, you know, obviously you're gonna look, for, you, you know, one looks for, if you're gonna mimic skill, you look for a lot of low modulus materials uh, that are, you know, that are very stretchy. But I, I would say with prosthetics, often you're simulating something. It's not a direct translation. So it's considered now with breast prosthetics that you have to replace the weight of the breast. And in fact, that just creates a lot of functional problems. So um, so in essence, you're sort of trying to balance different issues. You don't want something heavy, but you want something that mimics soft tissue. So it's a different, it's a very difficult technical challenge. And often you do it not just through the materials that you are using, but through the structure. How, how you how you create the structure of the prosthesis in the materials you choose. Okay, interesting. So then, how do breast prostheses differ from the silicone inserts that are used in surgery? So, so if if, if you're talking about implants, silicone implants are normally, well, actually, silicone implants are made out of gel. And, this, and the silicon implants are really were developed to augment a healthy breast. So that was really the original reason for them to develop is to take a healthy breast and just increase the volume. So implants, and then obviously with women with, with breast cancer wanting to have a shape and some volume to replace the breast that was removed by surgery, you know, Breast implants have been very effective, but they don't mimic the shape of the remaining breast. So, you know, often, no matter what you do, either with surgery or even with prosthetics, I mean, there's always the limit to what you can achieve. If you're always having to um, accept one shortcoming because for something else. So, so the external breast prosthesis that's common now as a pre-made prosthesis is still a pre-made volume with a urethane shell. I mean, breast implants have a silicone shell, but the inside is gel. And just because it's a very moldable material, but again, you know, gel has a specific weight of, of water. So when you're getting into the functional aspects of an external breast prosthesis, weight is a, is a really detracting feature. Definitely. And so are there any specific materials that you like to use within your prosthesis? You know, silicone is really the, the, the material, of, I mean, it's still considered the more, most optimal biomaterial. Um, I mean, silicone, as you know, can be anything from a hard plastic to a to a gel. So there's a large sort of continuum of physical properties. So um, so everything I do is silicone, but there's a tremendous variability in the materials I use. Interesting. Awesome. And so then from your personal experience, do you think that only women can cover, you know, like devices like breast prosthesis for women? Or is there no gender restriction? Okay, say that again. I'm sorry, I got distracted. So no worry. So can is it producing breast prostheses for women? Is that something you believe that women have an advantage over men for, and this job should be left primarily towards women, or do you think that there is no gender restriction? I would never say never that there is no gender restriction, but I do strongly believe that one's personal experience informs one's ability to understand understand the world around you. So, so I I think you know what I was trying to get at is you know often as women we don't have the opportunity to make our voices heard, or, or more importantly, to make our voices listened to. So that maybe we don't vocalize it, but they're not listened to and they're not recorded. And they're not there as sort of evidence-based medicine going forward. So I would say that um, 
you know, I, I, I would never say that nobody can ever do anything, but I would say that speaking directly out of your own experience as a woman, mm -hmm. especially as you get older, you realize how profound that is. And, and I also, I would say with custom breast prostheses, there's a, it's a very collaborative uh, process. There's a lot of um, information sharing and, and there's a lot of touching, a lot of seeing, a lot of looking. So, so I would never say you can't do it, but I would say that being a woman is, is an asset. Gotcha. Wonderful. So we have two more questions here and I think I probably, you can probably field one or two more before we have to wrap things up. But one of the things that people are wondering are what kind of technology do you use to create these prototypes or these breast prostheses in terms of both the scanning technology and the 3D printers? Um, I've used, I mean, I sort of have a, 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 a constant sort of R&D practice. So I am really excited with the scanning technology that's becoming available with the latest iPhones. So with the iPhone 11, and particularly the 12, because I really think it opens up a lot of creativity and a lot of possibility and a lot of access. Um, with the rest of the work that I do, I mean, I'm, I'm almost like, I like, with the rest of the work that I do, when I print something, I want to modify it because I'm actually using it for a prototype. So I use uh, Ultimaker 3 and I, I print in PLA because it's very easy to grind. So then I grind it, modify it. Sometimes I add wax, create a new shape, scan it. So I have a new digital file. Um, and as I said, what I'm really excited about now is the capabilities of 3D printing directly in silicon. So, um, so, so I think there's just, you know, there's a lot of, possibility of doing things in a new way. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Well, that's it for the Q&A. Unless anyone has any other last minute questions, feel free to place them right now or filter keys. But Irene, I want to say thank you so much for your time today and thank explain you. to us this really interesting message that I feel is definitely lacking in the mainstream storytelling of prostheses. You never, you hear about the feet for, you know, toddlers and people and even animals as well, but you never hear about breast prostheses for women. I think it's absolutely wonderful that you were able to share that with us today. Thank you. Mm -hmm. For sure. Thank you so much for joining us.